All hey, right. hey, everyone. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> All right, welcome to the CS Education Zoo, everyone. This is episode number five, uh, and I'm here. I'm Steve Wolfman, and I'm here with my co-host, Will Bird. Will? Hello. Uh, welcome to episode five, and we have a special guest today, a personal friend of mine and expert closure hacker, also someone who's been very... Uh, involved in computer science education uh, in sort of a different way than some of our previous guests, and less academic way, but in a great way in terms of bringing in uh, or, or trying to extend computer science ideas to uh, the programming community, the hobbyist community, the artistic community, and so forth. Um, so I'm very excited to have David Nolan here, who, in addition to being a fine programmer and a fine teacher, is also a musician, and a, has a background in film, and uh, hopefully we'll learn about all those sorts of things and how he learned to become so multifaceted and maybe how that's affected his outlook on computer science teaching and, and learning. All right, without any further ado, welcome to David. Hello. Hi. So do you want to just give a, a, a kind of brief background of of how you got into programming, or maybe what you do now that you work for Cognitech. You know, how, so sort of how did you, I know at one point in time you were a film student at NYU, is that correct, at uh, ITP? Uh, I actually studied film in at UT Austin. I did an undergrad in film. Um, at one point I thought I was going to be a filmmaker. Um, I ended up liking music, playing music more. Um, but as far as like the computing thing, uh, I mean, my parents bought a computer like in the late '80s. It was Apple IIs. My brother and I programmed Basic, you know. And so I, you know, we were really into programming. Uh, and we've been pro we were programming uh, games since we were little. And then I got to film, and then um, I don't know. In the in the mid '90s, to me, computers were very boring. When I was in film school, I was very bored by them. Um, somewhere towards the end, uh, uh, I mean, it was really funny because I, I'd lost interest. But it was really like when when Apple started sort of refreshing the design of computers and the Internet started happening, I was like, well, maybe this Internet and this computer thing is interesting to me again. Um, I didn't actually really get into computers until I came to New York. Uh, I got a degree in new media um, at, a, at NYU at Tisch. And I ended up sort of re-familiarizing myself with programming. Uh, and then I got a job, you know, typical PHP, Java, JavaScript type thing. Uh, and I've been doing programming professionally you know, since, uh, I guess, past almost nine years as a professional programmer. Uh, but before I became a professional programmer, I spent a lot of time um, when I was sort of teaching myself, re-familiarizing myself with programming, I used the uh, structure interpretation of computer programs as a, as a sort of way to get back into it. And I didn't know anything about Lisp. So that sort of experience sort of shaped uh, my interests as a professional developer. So, so is that what led you to your interest in Clojure? Um, well, when I encountered SIGP, I was like, this is really awesome. This is really cool. Um, but I didn't know I, I didn't know anybody that was using Scheme. So I was like, okay, that's like the most amazing book I've read. Like, you know, it's up there with like, you know, great works of art that I appreciate. I was like, this is an amazing book. Um, but I didn't, I really didn't see, I, I had no, you know, couldn't figure out where people were actually using this stuff. Uh, so I sort of set it to the side. Uh, then I was in New York, and I was working for three or four years doing, working for Princeton University and some startups. And then around this time, I had, like, a break. I decided to take a summer off. Um, and I had recently become familiar with sort of Paul Graham's essays on Lisp. And there was a small but sort of uh, excited community of young programmers around Lisp. And I was like, well, maybe I should look at Common Lisp and look at Scheme. Um, uh, I thought Scheme was cool. Uh, I thought Common Lisp was cool. I spent a lot of time with Common Lisp that summer. Common Lisp at the time was kind of hard to set up, though. 
so I got kind of frustrated with that. It was it was like not a great development experience, especially if you were coming from a Java, Python, or Ruby background where there's because of the size of the communities, there's um fairly good tooling available. Wasn't true for Common Lisp. Um, around that time, I sort of heard of Closure, and Closure, I sort of jumped on it be simply because it was a jar, and I could download the jar, and I can start a REPL. Um, and that definitely wasn't the case for, you know, compiling and installing SPCL. It's, it's easy now. It's, it's easy now, but it wasn't easy in the summer of 2008. So I ended up jumping on the Closure bandwagon. Um, it was also, I liked Clojure because I, when I was at ITP, uh, people were very big on processing. The processing is this sort of like interactive computing environment that sort of emphasizes, um, you know, interact, you know, building sort of interactive art. Um, and, and Clojure was interesting because it had seamless JVM interop. And I actually, some of my first experiments were just like live coding uh, interactive applications with processing. Uh, and that was really cool to me because you can't do that with um, processing out of the box. It doesn't really support live eval the way that, you know, lists traditionally do. So do you, I, I know you have degrees in, in film and in new media. Do you, do you have any formal experience uh, in computer science or did you take any classes along those, uh, along those lines or are you mostly self-taught as far as that goes in, in oh. reading books and papers? Uh, I would say reading books and papers. Um, I mean, I also think that, like, my background definitely, you know, almost all the work that I have done professionally is around UI programming. And UI programming is more art than I think science and always has been and will probably will continue to be for the foreseeable future. Um, it also sort of jived with my sort of visually oriented interests. Uh, you sort of interaction programming, UI programming, um, and I think in UI programming, you don't encounter quite as much, uh, in many cases, the need for, you know, deep insight into PL or um, data structures or anything like that. Um, you can get by without that stuff. Um, though it's definitely useful. Not to say that it's not useful. I've later come to realize that those things are extremely useful. Um, but I think you can get pretty far without knowing that stuff if you're doing UI programming. Okay, uh, and yet, of, of all the people I know, you're someone who is probably you know, one of the most passionate people about reading academic papers and trying to read books and trying to understand ideas and programming languages and share those with other people. So you know, how, did, how did that come about? Was that just a personal interest from doing things like reading SICP, or did you realize you know, at some point that, that these ideas really were powerful to you, or you know, was this... You know, like, like, how did you get to this point? Because I, I also know lots of people who do UI programming who, who aren't as interested in, you know, sort of fundamental PL concepts and that sort of thing. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I, maybe it, you know, it's hard to tell. So I've been doing, for me, it seems like, uh, you know, okay, so one thing I liked about SICP, I think one thing I liked, I liked about SICP is that I had done some C and some C++ and some Java, and I sort of, always looked at programming languages uh, from the perspective of a, of a consumer. Like, you know, I've received this programming language on a stone tablet from the heavens, and, you know, I really didn't think that programming languages are fundamentally ideas that people designed and created, um, and they're flawed in, this, in, the, all, in the same way that all sort of, you know, human endeavors, endeavors are, but SIGP was really eye-opening because a lot of things that I thought were really complicated and really sophisticated like, there's no way for a mortal to understand. Um, SICP really shows you that, like, no, objects, you can, you can actually model objects very quickly. Uh, and actually, uh, some of the most powerful abstractions that are available um, are, are actually incredibly simple. You know, at least getting the simple thing working is, is not hard. And then when you get to the metacircular evaluator where you're sort of building an interpreter for the first time and you're sort of um, are building your own programming language, uh, it really changed my perspective on, uh, I think, on what I thought the activity of programming is. Um, and uh, it also, I think, um, showed me that there's a lot of history and there's a lot of context. And often people are just sort of, again, uh, blindly receiving these, these ideas without 
realizing that um, with almost anything in computer science, there are many ways. To, there are many ways to do things, uh, and in fact, uh, by exploring the alternative sort of solutions, you can guide yourself to a better solution. Uh, that's something else that I learned over time. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. My interest in my interest in CSE stuff is definitely based on my frustrations with programming in general, right? Like, you, you work on the same problem enough times and you think, there's got to be a better way to do this. Somebody must have thought of it. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so, so, well, I guess we could also talk about some, some of the programs you're known for, especially in the Clojure community. There's your work on Core Match, a uh, very nice pattern matcher, which I know some of the ideas, some of those ideas you took from some academic papers and ended up in Apple's new Swift language. And also, of course, you did work in CoreLogic. And most recently, you're doing work in Core Async. Do you, do you want to just briefly talk about those projects? And then maybe we can talk about uh, some of your educational things that you've been interested in that I think are, are very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So um, so that's I think that's another cool thing about Lisp is that Lisp systems tend to be simple. Um, I think it's just a benefit of the of the idea. Um, lists have very little syntax, so actually getting into sort of like what would normally be considered very sophistic sophisticated types of programming um, are actually not hard in Lisp. Like so, with with uh, the core match stuff, the pattern matching, um, uh, you know, people see that as sort of a black art, but really, uh, in a language like Lisp where you have macros. Um, Writing a pattern match compiler, you don't have to worry about syntax. You don't have to worry about parsing. You really can take um, uh, whatever match syntax you want to use, and you can expand it out into um, list forms that you need. So it was great. So when I when I did core match, people were like, "I can't believe you figured all this stuff out." But it was beautiful. In Lisp, it was like I could read the original paper, which was um, aimed at OCaml, um, the OCaml community or the, sort of the typed functional programming community. But the algorithm was very straightforward. Um, so it was easy, easy to port. There's a few obstacles in my, in my path. Um, I think similarly, that's why I was attracted to Mini Camerons, which is um, uh, the system that uh, Will and uh, Dan and Oleg came up with, which is a really amazing sort of um, embedding of relational programming into C. And uh, you know, same same experience. I, I I got the reason schemer, and then uh, when I opened when I opened I went through the whole book. I, it took me like three months to get through that book, and I was like, that was like one of the hardest things I'd worked through, and one of the coolest things I'd worked through. And then I was really sort of pissed off at the end when I saw the entire implementation in two pages, <laughs> and um, that's when I like hunted down um, Will's dissertation. And again, that was like another um, sort of like. Aha moment that um, this is a really cool place to explore ideas. Uh, I think it's, 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 it has a nice, simple set of tools, and you can really um, focus on the core ideas and not get distracted with extraneous concerns. And uh, what, what about core async? Uh, that's sort of the newest thing you've been working on, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I've been doing. I, I actually don't, you know, I, I, I sort of, with Core Async, what I did was mostly make sure that it works well with ClojureScript, uh, because I'm the sort of lead maintainer on ClojureScript, which is a compiler from um, a very large subset of Clojure to JavaScript. So I, I work on the compiler as well as the standard library. Uh, so when I worked on Core Async, it was mostly ensuring that we would be able to get the, um, the same... CSP semantics in the browser as well as get good performance uh, in the browser. Uh, but CS, so it's Core Async is really cool if you haven't heard of it. Um, it's basically Tony Hoare's like uh, abstraction from the 70s. Uh, we've uh, taken that abstraction and we've borrowed some ideas from concrete implementations like Google, Google Rob Pike, who was at Bell Labs. He had, he has had a variety of of CSP-based languages. The most recent is Go, which is actually making waves um, in the uh, sort of mainstream programming community. And uh, it's actually a fairly, in my opinion, not exciting language. But uh, the cool thing about Go is that it's getting a lot of people familiar with CSP. 
Uh, so, so what is what is CSP? Uh, communicating sequential processes. Uh, yeah. so that's Tony's Tony Orr's abstraction uh, for yeah. reasoning about concurrent, like independent processes and how they communicate with each other and coordinating between them. So it's a concurrency abstraction. Um, uh, because I mean, so so to yeah, maybe to backtrack a little bit more. Um, all the problems that we have today were known <laughs> probably in the, in the years between 1960 and 1970, right? So people knew that locks were horrible. People knew that shared memory parallelism with mutable data structures was terrible. Um, that that uh, threading was too low of an abstraction. Mutexes are too low of a level of abstraction. So CSP was born out of the realization that... Um, we needed higher level abstractions. Um, it has not. Uh, it's kind of exciting now, uh, largely due to uh, to Go and Core Async. I think a lot of mainstream programmers are becoming aware of its utility. Uh, and what's really cool about it, the coolest thing about CSP, which I like, it's actually I think something that's not obvious in Go that I think uh, Closure really drives home is that CSP works great for concurrency, regardless of whether your um, programming language environment is single-threaded or multi-threaded, right? That's what's so awesome about CSP, is that it gives you a, a way to reason about concurrency regardless of whether you have real threads or not. And, that, and that's borne out in ClojureScript, which I think is pretty cool. OK, well, yeah, so you've been working on these very cool projects. And one thing that's interesting to me is that each one of these has Interesting ideas behind them, right? It's not just it's not just hacking. Like they actually have interesting computer science ideas that are that are pretty fundamental. Um, so, getting into your educational activities, you know, so so a couple of things I know of that you've been involved in. You've probably been involved in more things, but you know, obviously you've been very actively involved in the closure community, giving lots of talks there, for example, and trying to bring the academic and computer science and, and uh, industry and practitioners together. You've also been very heavily involved in hacker school. Maybe you could say a little bit about that and why you think it's such and cool. And also, I know you have something more recent called Kitchen Table Coders. Uh, so could you talk about some of these educational things you're doing and, and maybe your broader perspective on on these these projects and why those are interesting or important to you, and maybe how how does your viewpoint maybe differ from uh, from more traditional academic computer science education? Right. So I think uh, maybe my style is sort of informed by my experience at ITP, uh, the Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU, and it's kind of interesting what they have going on there, where they sort of it's a new media program. They get like architects and artists and writers and playwrights and actors and just, just a random assortment of people, many of which don't have any programming experience at all. Um, also, people do a lot of physical computing there at ITP. Um, it's very, um, that's very popular. And so what happens in an environment like that where you don't have um, a broad base of sort of experts or, or a lot of expertise around the technology is that people have to teach themselves. Uh, people, in fact, if somebody acquires a bit of knowledge, it's really useful to share that knowledge because often, um, uh, by sort of having this culture of sharing stuff, you will you'll often learn something in return, right? I I I'll learn about um, I'll show somebody something about programming and they'll show me something about how to program Arduino. And uh, and I and what I've learned or my experience that experience showed me that it's really important to have these learning environments where I don't know people people mutually benefit from uh, shared knowledge. Especially if that, you know, again, uh, different kinds of information. Uh, and then what I ended up teaching there for a long time, I probably for three years, I was a uh, adjunct uh, teaching various topics, whether it was programming or more sort of like, you know, art oriented yet still technology based stuff. Um, and I like teaching. Teaching is fun. I mean, I feel like teaching is a great way to learn. Like for me, as as it, it's awesome, more fun, because you get to learn um, new things yourself. Uh, and so we, so that experience sort of informed KTC, which is uh, Kitchen Table Coders. Uh, we occasionally run workshops here in this studio. Uh, it's very small. We, we, we like to, the group to be small because I think 
in general, we prefer that the experience be very hands-on. And the only way to really get things to be hands-on is if the class size is quite small. Um, and we run you know, four to eight hour workshops uh, on a variety of topics. Um, a lot of them, you know, programming or art or um, science related in some way. Uh, so, oh yeah, on the hacker school. Hacker school, so, so hacker school is interesting because hacker school was started by three people. One of them was uh, this uh, lady, Sonali, and we were actually in the same class at ITP. And I think the ITP sort of, sort of open learning sort of philosophy heavily influenced the design of hacker school. And uh, I was invited there a couple of times as a resident and as a guest speaker. Uh, and I think it's great. And they sort of like uh, took the ITP idea where people are working on lots of things and sort of narrowed it down to uh, the practice of programming. But, uh, you know, the practice of programming is a pretty broad topic. So, uh, it still works. Hey, can you briefly explain sort of what Hacker School is or how it works and how it's kind of not a school? <laughs> right. So Hacker School is more like a writer's like a, a, a writer's retreat, but for coders. Um, they it's they run it now. I think it's like a little bit complicated, but they run batches. People apply. It's based in um, New York, New York City. Um, at one time, I think they have about 70 students, like, at one time. Um, and they have a, several facilitators. And it's a, really an environment in which people teach themselves uh, to code. And they teach themselves programming language concepts. Uh, and, it's, it's, and it lasts three months. Um, it's great. And, you know, they do a really great job of getting both people who don't have a lot of background as well as people who have already graduated with CS degrees, who have a lot of industry experience, and when you get everybody to the same room, it, it kind of um, kind of makes for a great environment. Uh, you know, I, I sort of definitely believe in when you have a diversity of um, of experience, it ends up being a lot more fun. Well, very cool. I, I've got a zillion other questions I could ask, but let me let me uh, give a chance for Steve to to uh, jump in here. Steve, did you? Uh, do you have anything you want to ask? Yeah, I'd love to. I got a couple queued up. Uh, I was excited to hear your fire hose of questions too, though. That was great. Um, so, David, l let me uh, let me start with the most recent thing you mentioned. So, you said that hacker school is a place for people to teach themselves how to code, to learn how to code, and also to learn programming language ideas. And I'm kind of curious. It sounds like to you, those two things are are one, and certainly that fits with the SICP. Uh, perspective, but there's lots of people who learn to program and and they don't learn any what we might think of as programming language concepts. So so why do you see those as as entangled? Why is it important that they are together? Uh, right. So um, I mean, my experience is that uh, having worked in the industry for a long time is I actually think that the problem of programming languages and the various activities that real-world engineers uh, engage in are not really separate, right? I mean, if you look at the way that people design APIs or the way they design libraries, uh, you're always encountering um, problems around language. Uh, it's just a, you're just really talking about at what level of abstraction. Um, and I think it's really extremely important that uh, people that are getting into uh, programming language that they see that. Uh, you, I mean, you don't want to you don't want to throw too much at a young programmer, like you know, you know. Often with very inexperienced programmers, you maybe want to stick with one language, stick with the basic concepts. But I think it's important to say at the bat, you know, keep it in in their in their you know to remind them that you know there there are there are other languages, there are other approaches, there are other abstractions, and this is one very particular uh, approach, uh, and it's just you know really a peephole into a much bigger world. And I think it's just a good way to keep, you know, keep things in perspective. So would it be fair to say maybe that that the importance of programming languages for for programmers is that uh, learning about programming languages is a, a way of focusing on the idea that we're always trying to take what's in our head and say it in in a way that that is realizable. And programming languages are about understanding the different ways to say the things that we're thinking. Uh, I, yeah, 
for example, I mean, very few people program in this assembly. It's like it's like this thing. It's like it's just a simple example, right? It's very difficult to reason about code at the level of assembly. It's just it's just too far below the the the, the concerns of the programmer. Um, but as it turns out, that 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 often is the case, right? You, you can, you can, you're a web programmer, you're a JavaScript programmer, and you're doing web browser stuff. And you, you quickly encounter this problem where you're like, the DOM, the document object model, the, 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 the fundamental abstraction of the web browser, it's just too low level. Um, it's, not, it's not a good place to reason about the system. Um, <laughs> but you really encounter this in programming languages as well. Um, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are good constructs, Every, every language is a constructs that I think are um, good and things you should reach for all the time. And then there are constructs that you're like, well, maybe I really should avoid that one. It's useful in, in, a, in a much narrower set of cases. Um, and, I, and, you know, I, I think you encounter this all the time. You know, in, you know, in mainstream, people call this best practices, right? Like, I don't know. I, okay. I hope that answers your question somewhat. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, all right, so then let me jump way back. You said something that really intrigued me earlier, which was that uh, computers were boring in the mid '90s, uh, and I'm I'm just kind of uh, I'm curious to poke further at the idea that idea. What what was not boring? What was exciting about computers before, and what was boring during that, and what made them exciting again afterward? Well, I mean, I think when the when you were young, if you were young, I mean, the the personal computing revolution really started taking off in the um, in the eighties, right? In the late eighties, you it was a lot of people were had their very first computer. You were you were surrounded by people who had their first computer. Families had their first computer, so it was very new. By the time you got to the nineties, people were on their second or third computer, and uh, except for the fact that your games looked cooler, I mean, what people were doing with computers was more or less the same. Um, it didn't really change until the internet came around. That was pretty interesting. Um, but around that time, you also had, you know, and Java is, is fine. People people write interesting software systems with Java, but Java sort of took over, right, um, in a in a very big way, um, uh, and probably for reasons that made sense. It was a programming language that shipped out of the box with some basic ability to run in multiple places. Um, basic facilities for talking over networks, um, uh, you know, garbage collection. The fact that it shipped with a garbage collector was radical uh, at the time. You know, it was very unusual. Um, and it sort of, for 10 years, I, feel, I really felt like that Java was the only game in town uh, if you were going to be a developer. In fact, I mean, when I, when I would hang out with my CS friends, I mean, CS seemed like, you know, Java vocational, you know, training. But it's changed. I mean, I, we, I think we've come around, right? I think um, with the recent interest in functional programming um, and new languages, it's been awesome. I mean, I, I think it's, it's great. Uh, we finally, well, we're slowly inching towards something else. You know, so I would say that like things like Go and Swift are incremental steps. Even something like Clojure is an incremental improvement um, over the, big, the really big list of ideas. Uh, but but at least we're heading in a different direction finally. Okay, thank you. Uh, Will you want to take the next one? I've got some more, sure. but I'm sure you've got. Sure. I guess as a follow up to that, you know, one thing that's happened to me, I I too have been programming for a long time, and you know, one thing that would happen is at some point, I don't know, I, I would feel like I had the knack for certain things, you know, and, and it would become less interesting to me. And then I would discover something totally different, like functional programming. It's like, whoa, I don't know how to program anymore, right? This is kind of interesting because now, now I get to relearn. I get to be a newbie again, right? And the same thing happened when I discovered logic programming and, you know, or term rewriting systems or these other, the other systems or languages or paradigms, right? So, so do you think that was also part of it? And do you think that's, that that's one reason that sh that programming languages are important for education for for programmers is that it gives them it gives them a chance after they've been programming for a while to to see to, to sort of force on them by picking a new language that hey there really is a totally different way of doing it and if you think you really know how to program well in C and that that's all that's all there is to it try writing some prolog programs and then 
you're going to have to have an attitude adjustment, right? Yeah, I, I definitely think it's important, though. I think that's, that's I think, um, it's trickier, though. I think, uh, so you have, you have a, I will say, like, if you take existing programming practice in the industry, I mean, a lot of the things that people are doing are actually extremely sophisticated. When you look at, like, the types of systems that are being built at big companies with what I would consider, like, not very sophisticated languages, okay, maybe maybe their approach is bad, but in the end, they are building very sophisticated systems. Extremely sophisticated distribute, distributed computing, very extremely sophisticated concurrent systems. Um, I mean, people are doing amazing stuff given the sort of limitations of the material that's being used to build these things. Um, and so there's a challenge. I think, you, I think with functional programming, with relational programming, um, with these ideas, uh, you know, the, I think the important thing is really to show people how um, it simplifies the, the problems that people already understand, right? Uh, and I think that's the, the, the big challenge. And a lot, of time, a lot of times when I explore concepts um, myself, uh, I'm, I'm always looking for, okay, this is really awesome. Um, let, me, let me see if I can figure out where I can actually, uh, where this lines up with a problem I had in, in, in um, a more traditional setting. Does it simplify um, solutions in that more traditional setting? Absolutely. Okay, so, so changing uh, track a little bit, could talk about some educational things again. The, the um, you know, one, one thing that, that I think you have a reputation for is, is for trying to um, interest people in industry and hobbyists to look at some work in academia and to read papers. You get a very nice uh, keynote talk at Strange, uh, I think it was a Strange Loop last year about how practitioners should should read papers because some of these problems have already been solved and so forth. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about how you th think uh, we could improve you know, communication between industry and academia? Or are there better ways that, that we can improve that coordination? And are there ways that people learn in industry that you think people in academia could learn from and vice versa? Well, it's, so it's, I mean, I think it's, that's an interesting problem. Um, I mean, some of these things, um, it's hard to see, uh, right? Because you, you, you can't, you can't, there's some things that's impossible to predict. Um, a good, a good, ver a good version of this is actually, so the most recent thing I've actually worked on is it's not, um, these closure, closure and closure script libraries, but it's this thing, it's this library I wrote called Ohm, which is, um, it's an abstraction over Facebook's React library. React is a, um, it's a uh, sort of UI programming framework for the browser, but what's cool about React is that it adopts a, um, it's like a graphics pipeline approach. So if you do any serious amounts of computer graphics programming, you have this problem in which you have the GPU, but the GPU is it's distant, and you need to basically prepare all your information in order so that you can send it to the GPU in one swoop. Uh, you, you really can't have too much communication with this remote service. And the benefit of actually doing it sort of this batched rendering is that you get incredible performance, right? So the reason um, uh, games look so great is because people have simply uh, adopted this model where you have this extremely uh, specialized hardware architecture, and you're, you have to speak to it in a very specific way. And it's actually very functional. If you looked at like hardcore graphics programming, it's actually um, functional programming with really horrible syntax. Um, so, so React works this way. It's a, basically it's like an immediate mode rendering system. Um, and something that I saw when I encountered it, which was sort of uh, suggested to me by my friend Brandon Bloom, is that you can actually make their system faster with immutable data structures. Right, so this is like a very, very non-obvious thing. Um, in fact, I could, you could probably look around a lot and not encounter anybody coming to this conclusion that you could actually write um, a virtual sort of, it's a, basically a virtual DOM representation, and you can actually drive um, their diffing algorithm with immutable data structures, and you can beat um, imperative solutions. So that's the cool thing about React plus immutable data, 
is faster than what people are doing by hand um, by talking to the DOM directly. And that's something that you really can't encounter without simply saying, well, I think immutable data structures are cool. I like programming with them. And then some other piece of technology just happens to appear, and then you have a realization, and then you have a very interesting solution that's actually extremely applicable and easy to communicate to mainstream programmers. So I think, again, the question isn't like, how, you know, how do you convince people to just look at research or just look at um, mainstream practices? Again, I think it's a problem of diversity, right? If you have enough people with enough broad base of knowledge, you have the opportunity to connect the dots, right? It's not like engineers can immediately see how to apply science or academics immediately understand the problems engineers have. I think you have to have a culture in which both parties are aware of the, the problems and the um, approaches, right? Uh, that, I mean, that's, that's been my experience. So, so that's something that you see in hacker school when you have people from different backgrounds showing up, and it's something that you can see, I guess, with industry consulting from people in academia or maybe industry internships from students. You know, are there other ways to try to make this happen or, you know, to... Should should more people in academia, you know, be doing consulting with industry or trying to look at these industry project problems, or you know, do you think it's okay? Do you think it's happening enough? And you know, it's uh, just one of these things that uh, you can't really force it anymore. People will will figure these things out, or do you think that you know, people in academia, for example, you know, do do people in academia need to find better or easier ways to make some of these ideas understandable, or do you think? Do you think the research source is already out there? Well, I, I think it's. I still think it's a problem of communication. I think if you if you have academics, um, if academics take uh, sort of engineering concerns more seriously and like look into how people, and also also sometimes there's often often missed opportunities where you have um, a community of of practitioners applying a thing, but maybe the the researcher isn't even aware that their research is being applied. And in fact, um, that their research should probably, uh, you know, be slightly modified because these people put the, the basic ideas into practice and maybe some things about the model needed tweaking. Um, um, I think that happens a lot. Uh, but it, I think it's just an awareness issue, right? I, I don't know if there's anything other than, like, I think both groups just need to pay more attention. Gotcha. Um, okay, well, I, I could follow up on that, but uh, uh, Steve, do you have anything else uh, that you want to ask, or I'm trying well, to follow up all the time? I've got my usual, and and we've got a couple of questions queued up from uh, from our audience. So uh, so should I ask one of my uh, stock ones, and then maybe we should go for an audience question? Or yeah, sounds good. All right. There's there's a couple of questions I try to always ask David. So one is, uh, can you describe a teacher that you've had that you admired and and what you admired about that person? Uh, well, I mean, I've, I've had quite a few teachers that that I that I that I've liked. Um, but I mean, I, that's a, it's a bit of a weird question because I learn things from I learn things from a lot of people. I mean, I, I feel like, I mean, everybody is a teacher, really. I mean, I, I don't think I've acquired any interesting idea. There are very few ideas that I could call my own. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Like, uh, it's, I, I've mostly learned uh, things by synergizing ideas that I've received from other people. Uh, the, what was the other, what was the other, was there some other part to that question? Well, just to, to pick someone that you've, you've learned a great deal from or that, that, was, that was really influential on you and, and to say why they were important, what made them important to you. Um, I, don't, I mean, it's really hard for me to pick one person. I don't know if I have a good answer to that question. Were there any mentors that you know, kind of tuck, took you under your wing when you needed some guidance and helped you out? I mean, I just, it's, just, it's just such a long list of people, right? It's like I could... <laughs> I can name people from every year since I began speaking that have been mentors and guided me to where I am today. <laughs> it would just 
and the rest of the CSS zoo thinking people. <laughs> I, I can see this is this is like the ITP way, right? Where it's like everyone's just always collaborating. And if you'd asked me, uh, like, uh, um, you know, three years ago when I first met you and Dan, I mean, that was like an amazing moment. I was like, I was really excited about relational programming. I was totally in the weeds. I had no idea, um, you know, being able to be able to speak to you and email with you and like meet you at conferences and talk to Dan and see what you guys are working on and really and like get get sneak previews of research they haven't published yet. I mean, these are all, that's like, I mean, you. That there's nothing better than that. And that's uh, uh, definitely, yeah. You know, I feel like at different points in your life, there's, 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 there's somebody you're like, I'm so glad that they were there to help me at that moment in time. Um, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> That'll do. Uh, so, Will, do you want to take one of our audience questions? Yeah, sure. Well, I also just should point out that, you know, I guess it goes both ways because, uh, yeah, David always has this very refreshing point of view, right? And, you know, I like David's attitude very much that there's always more one, more one than one approach. And, you know, the, I think uh, in academia especially, it's very easy to, to get really focused on, hey, this is the right way to do it, or this is really cool, or this has very beautiful theory or math, and... Very easy, you know. I have to kind of resist myself from bashing on Java or whatever. And you know, David's always very good. It's like, well, you know, there, there actually are multiple ways to do this, and, and each one has uh, its advantages. So, so I definitely appreciate that. I feel like I've become more less closed-minded every time I talk to David. Uh, okay, so an audience question here. I will uh, start with Julian's question. Uh, we're seeing the rise of types in functional programming languages like Haskell and Idris. Now SQL has grown out of Datalog from Prolog uh, from Lisp. Do you see a future for types in making SQL equivalents more robust at compile time and easier to refactor? I guess this maybe is less of an education question, more like a future of programming question. Right, right. I mean, I think that um, I think types will continue to be important. Um, I think there's tons of interesting research, especially uh, of particular interest to me is the gradual typing stuff because that's sort of trying to bridge the fact that, I mean, a lot of there is the like things like Haskell, which are which really have not broken into the mainstream. The sort of like ML derived approach to types, which is extremely powerful. Um, uh, the the kinds of guarantees that those systems can give you is like pretty amazing. Um, to some degree, I think Scala is, is, has, has had some luck bringing that to a wider audience. Um, but I, I, I actually think that probably the more fruitful thing will be bringing types to, or allowing people to overlay types over what are traditionally dynamic programming languages. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting work to do there. But I actually don't think it's really a question about just types. I mean, I think um, a lot of the research around contracts, around verification of contracts, uh, around, around and they even like some of the most interesting stuff is where where people have to contract from code itself. Like you basically write regular code, and then through analysis they're able to uh, detect invariant and verify them. Or, you know, point out inconsistency. Um, I mean, it just seems like like a lot of things in in CS. There's a lot more to learn, a lot more work to do. And I think that kind of covered Dan's question as well, Will. That was Dan's was sort of the abstraction of Julian's question, and that's that's where uh, David went, I think. Yeah, that's right. So, so you know, Dan's question was, where will programming be in five years? So, so I guess I can ask the educational equivalent, uh, especially with things like concurrency and parallelism that aren't always taught to to beginning programmers, right? They're still seen usually as more advanced concepts. Um, you know, where what would you like to see, or, or where do you think we can go in sort of computer science education and teaching? And you know, do you think things like parallelism and concurrency, uh, abstractions, things like CSP should should be taught earlier? And you know, are these ideas actually not that hard, and we just should show people earlier and not treat them as so hard, and people just get used to it? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think there is some utility in. 
There's definitely some. It's definitely a good idea to talk about CSP. I mean, I, I definitely think that in like in the case of like education, I think it would be it would be great if more programs talked about the actor model. They talked about CSP, and also you know these systems have problems. And in fact, um, they, they you know they they they're very big systems that use the actor model. You can look at Erlang and, and really hear like where does the actor model model fall down. Um, you can probably ask in, in a couple of years a professional closure programmer, and they would say, "Yeah, CoreySync is amazing, but it has it has these problem areas. Uh, one of the biggest is deadlocks, right? And so something if you look at the old research around CSP, I mean, so much of verification of CSP system was automatic detection of deadlocks. Um, so that's a huge that's huge. Like if you could take a deadlock detection and apply it to a Go program, apply it to a closure program. I mean, there's a lot of interesting research that's been done uh, that could probably be further refined. Um, also, you have another cool academic thing called Quick Check. Quick Check is this um, sort of um, generative testing thing, but it has this really cool property in which um, it finds a minimal sort of sort of searches a space and finds a minimal set of steps to construct a failure. Um, and they've just started down the path of using it to test concurrent systems. And how they do this is by like taking your program, and then by substituting a scheduler into into QuickCheck. QuickCheck can actually be used to detect things like race conditions and deadlocks um, uh, in a probabilistic and generative fashion. Um, super cool. And and again, it's, that's that's like these those two things I just described are <laughs> direct bridge for research to fixing the program that I'm writing today. Um, Tons of opportunities, I think, there. Um, again, with with types, like I think bridging, bridging, bridging dynamic languages and type languages, I think is going to be huge. Um, data structures, I, I think, with Clojure, right? Uh, Clojure and Scala and Haskell have shown that like these persistent data structures really deliver amazing performance. Um, I don't think we've seen the end of the types of optimizations that are possible or the types of data structures that are possible. Uh, data structure research tends to be pretty slow, right? It's 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 really hard work, um, and requires a lot of um, both uh, math and then like a lot of empirical research, right? Um, um, and of of course, programming languages. I mean, I I feel like um, as we build more sophisticated systems, um, we want more from our programming language. I definitely think uh, as we as the types of software that we want to build become more sophisticated. We'll want um, to augment uh, our languages or move to entirely entirely different ones. And uh, I guess sort of the uh, last uh, double education question is, you know, what what other education or teaching or learning related initiatives or projects or ideas do you have that you would like to play with? You know, obviously you've got the kitchen table coders. You know, are there other things along those lines that if you had more time or resources or you know, one day you'd like to get to, you'd like to try? And what are the things you've learned from all of these educational and learning and teaching activities? Um, I don't know if there's anything else I would like to try, but uh, between 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 going to conferences and doing kitchen table coders and doing these blog posts, um, I, I think that uh, I think there is a large group of practitioners who um, who want to to find better ways to build the systems that they're building, and often they just need a small like bit of inspiration. Um, so that they can understand the concept without having to read a bibliography and read a hundred papers, right? I mean, I'm a big nerd and I don't mind reading all these things, but it's kind of like unre unrealistic to expect that everybody else will or want to. Uh, in fact, it's not important that they that they want to. Often, what you what they want is that like I see that you have an interesting idea, but show me how I can use it, um, so that they they can show other people how to use it. Um, I think that's that's been for me the a really big lesson that that you can say this is a this is a constraint solver and people like they like have no idea what you're talking about and then you show them a very short program that solves their problem in a very tiny amount of time and it's beautiful and it's declarative 
And then they suddenly get very excited and they say they want to know how it works. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think you know, giving people uh, tangible applications um, and spending time, like uh, the pedagogical side of that, uh, taking a very sophisticated idea and making it, sort of presenting it in a way that um, anyone can understand it, or somebody with at least a basic amount of experience in programming can understand what you're talking about. Um, it's been really rewarding to see people uh, respond so positively to blog posts in my talks about what I thought were pretty esoteric or crazy ideas, and people really say, no, this is awesome. This is, this is, you can explain it to me, and I think this is a good way to write software. That's really cool. Thank you. All right, Steve, do you have anything you want to ask? I've I've got a few more questions. I just want to check in on our time. Do we uh, we need to uh, we need to ask for shout outs before we finish? How are we doing? Uh, so we started a little after the hour, so I, I think we can go for one or two more questions. All right. Uh, so then I'm going to start with my uh, my other stock question. Get them both in. Uh, what's something you think every computer scientist, every uh, programmer? should read or learn or do or play with some experience they ought to have? I mean, for me, I, I, you know, I definitely, it's, um, I'm, I'm biased, but, like, you know, I, I definitely think that um, you should read Sick Pea. Sick Pea is totally awesome. Um, I, you know, now that I've played around with Prologue, I think that almost everyone should, like, pick up a copy of something like The Art of Prologue. Um, that's something I think that is not enough people understand the benefits of, of, of that approach. I also think that, like, uh, I actually think having a good grasp of typed functional programming is also extremely useful. Uh, there are lots of cool ideas. Um, I think Haskell, I mean, I don't have that much experience in Haskell, and actually Haskell has a few good educational texts, but I've also found Standard ML to be a really nice introduction to typed functional programming especially if you have experience in Scheme, because standard ML feels like Scheme with, like, you know, different syntax and types. Um, yeah, I think, I, think, I think those, I mean, I have such a huge list. I mean, I could, like, I would be like, a, a Dan, I really like Dan and um, Mitchell Wan's book, The Essentials of Programming Languages. Like, I feel like the Lambda Calculus, if you read, like, a book, like, I have this book right here. It's by by the Lambda Calculus and, and Combinators, an introduction by Hindley and Selden. And it's, I mean, you have to be pretty serious to read this. But you can read The Essentials of Programming Languages, and it really, that book explains the Lambda Calculus, and it's hands-on, right? It's like, you get to type the Lambda Calculus into your computer. <laughs> like, you get to touch the Lambda Calculus. Um, so I think, I, think, I think books like that are really great. I love computing because computing is a way to, like, make a lot of these um, abstract concepts tangible. But I think maybe, with the, hopefully that answered your, that, that question. It did. W Will, do you want to take the next one? Sorry, I'm writing down notes of things that I like. That's why, <laughs> that's why I keep looking over here. <laughs> OK. I actually have the Hindley and Selden book right next to me. <laughs> I bought every book on Lambda Calculus. Uh, anyway, well, uh, any, anyway, um, well, well, I guess are, are we getting close to shout out time, Steve? Is there anything else uh, you wanted to ask before shout outs? I've I've got a bunch more questions, but I feel like we could go on forever, so we should. Okay. Well, I have a one more question, then we'll do shout outs. So I'll leave it to you, Steve. All right. Okay. okay. So it's mine. Um, let me look over my list of questions here. So, uh, you've, as you've been talking, I get, a, I get a sense that you have a very strong aesthetic sense of what it means for a, a program to be a good solution and a beautiful solution. And I know it's way too big a question to ask what makes a program uh, a beautiful solution, but I wonder if you could just sort of explore that idea a little bit. What, what makes it so that... Uh, a, a solution, a programming solution, fits the problem. So I'm a strong believer that you can't know that something's a good solution until you know at least two solutions to a problem. 
right? You can't really know that something is good or bad uh, if you haven't at least tried to solve it at least two ways. Um, so yeah, I, I think the aesthetics often boils down to having done it one way and then having tried it in an alternate way um, and seen the trade-offs. Um, and then I think that you had the case where maybe you've tried it three ways or four ways. And then, and then I think you get closer to like, okay, I see that one of these, one of these ways is really nice, and the other ways weren't so nice. Um, but I can't, I don't think you can even get started on that path without having at least tried two ways of doing something. That's good. So do you feel like it's, I mean, is it always worth it to try two different ways when, when you're solving a problem? So, so I, I, so I was, you know, I was thinking about that when I, when I gave that answer. So I think um, the challenge is, is that you often encounter, um, you don't have time to try, for, try, try solving things four different ways, and that's why I think teaching is so important, right? The whole purpose of having a teacher is somebody who has experience, who has seen four different ways, uh, and in fact, they can actually, like, one of my favorite things is you like have a really great textbook and you have, a, you have a series of exercises, and they're small enough. And you can try a couple um, alternatives, and you at least get some sense of of how they might be different. Um, and then, with you know, if if you take on a larger problem, um, you you can see some of those benefits. But still, I think I think the thing is having people who have tried it a bunch of ways, and then those people communicating the trade offs um, is extremely important. I think a big a big part of education because. Um, you need filters, right? Because not everybody has the time to do all that research. All right, thank you. That's those are great thoughts for the <laughs> two minutes we had to talk about them. It's awesome. Um, all right, Will, I'll I'll give you. Okay. To you. Yeah, sure. Well, by the way, you know, just Dan Friedman. Whenever you work on a book with him, his view is if they ever have a doubt of how to write a chapter, you write it both ways at least, maybe three or four <laughs> ways, and you throw out all but one. <laughs> it's a lot of work, but it works, <laughs> it's, you know, it's good. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, so, so usually at the end we just ask, are there any shout outs or anything people you want to thank or, or uh, resources you want to point to or you know, people want to learn about kitchen table coding, you know, we can include a link to that, but uh, is there anything upcoming with that that you think uh, people would be interested in knowing about or talk about your blog or whatever? Uh, I mean, I you know, um, I would say, I would say, um, uh, you know, I always like to tell people to check out your your dissertation, check out the reason steamer, um, you know, check out the books that I've I've talked about. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, I would say like you know, read books, read papers, try crazy stuff. I don't know if any if I have shout out to that. <laughs> you can't give a shout out to my dissertation. <laughs> that looked like a, you're a plant. <laughs> no, not, not well, well, what, what about the kitchen table cutters? So, so, so can you say a little more about how that works? Because I've always been interested. You know, next time I'm in New York, I want to check it out. Like, can you? Oh, yeah. Can you just say a little bit about how it works? And you know, how, has it changed oh. over time? Like it's the format? Or? It changed a bit over time because we have more people. Um, uh, and we don't run them quite as much, actually, because we have more people. And so now it's, it's been a thing where it's actually kind of back to how it was. We only run them when we're, we're just some topic we're really excited about. Like, I'll probably talk about React um, and, and basically show React from, like, first principles. Um, we've done a really fun one on, in the past on datomic enclosure. Um, that's pretty cool because that's programming against a mutable database. It's pretty interesting. Um, we also run Code Salon. Uh, and code salon's really fun. We only we only do them. I mean, you should do one. And uh, and, and and you know, uh, if you next time you're in town, but we invite random people to come. And you know, the audience is 10 or 15 people, and it's like a salon. You know, we would just sit around. Uh, somebody talks about something that they're working on, and there's a lot of. It's mostly almost entirely QA. Um, that's a lot of fun. Uh, we we end up learning a lot there. Uh, we actually we had the guy, the Elm guy, show up. <laughs> Um, we also had the guy, one of the F Sharp developers, who worked a lot on um, type providers, which is really cool. It's um, sort of this really interesting approach to getting, you know typing um, external resources, which is a kind of a hard problem if you're in a typed context because 
the entire world is not in your programming language, and that's a that's a challenge. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's a bit of a free for all. You know, we, we kind of just do what 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 you know, whatever sort of happens, whatever we think is cool at the moment. We 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 run either a talk or a workshop on that thing. Well, that's fantastic. And you're still continuing work with hacker schools, right? You're are you I, like a uh, you're you're like a meta level person with hacker school? You were right where you were like yeah a, yeah. So I, I haven't been doing as much recently because I, I you know I, I was at the New York Times for four years and um, and I was plenty busy then. But you know um, I, I you know I, I really wanted to help out with with hacker school. But I've re recently switched jobs. Um, I'm at Cognitech and uh, I've been you know pretty heads down recently with Cognitech projects. So I haven't had quite as much time to poke in uh, over at Hacker School. But, but they're doing awesome stuff. Um, a lot of my friends, uh, uh, you know, people I know, I go like, you know, get this person to go speak, and they go speak. Um, you've been there. I think Nada Amin's been there. Uh, my friend Amit Pataru, who's, a, who's an artist and sort of uh, musician, he's, he's going there pretty soon. Um, yeah. Well, I love seeing all the... Uh... The creative approaches you have to teaching and learning, and uh, looking forward to seeing much more of it. And uh, looking forward to see you, seeing you at Closure Conj. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's gonna be fun. Yeah, we're gonna have the scheme workshop there. So once again, another effort to try to try to get the academic folks and the, the industry folks and hobbyists uh, talking together. I love that. All right, well, thank you so much, David. Uh, Steve, is there anything else you want to say before we before we end? I just want to say thank you and, and reiterate earlier, David mentions mentioned he learns from a lot of people, he learns from everybody he interacts with and uh, I, I want to thank you, David, and all of our guests so far on the CS Education Zoo. This has been a great chance to learn from people uh, with lots of different perspectives. All right. You're welcome and thank, thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks a lot and we'll sign off. Anyone wants to stay around the chat, we can do so.